Welcome everybody to this edition of the Singapore Convention on Mediation Seminar Series brought to you by IMI and Simi. I, of course, am Laura Skidlin, the Executive Director of the International Mediation Institute, and we're joined here by our friends from Simi, including Marcus Lim as CEO. Pleasure to be here, Laura. Thank you. Fantastic. So a little housekeeping before we get underway. For those of you who haven't used Zoom webinar before, you'll find a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you do have a question for Tony as he's talking or in the Q&A section afterwards, please do pop them into that section so that we can address them in good order. Now I'm going to ask Marcus to introduce Tony properly, but I'll add that I had the pleasure of sitting next to Tony actually at the signing of the Singapore Convention last year. And we've spoken a little bit since then. So it's great to see him again, but I'll get Marcus to do the formal introduction. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. So, you know, um, I, I had the privilege of meeting Tony, I think it was in 2018, no, 2019, last year, um, when, when I found out that Tony actually travels from Vietnam to Singapore quite often. Um, I think previously on arbitration work, but then he's also become one of the very quickly rising uh, lawyers and legal professional leaders uh, in Vietnam who are also pushing for mediation. And... You know, mediation in Vietnam is, I think, already part of the culture, the, just like many of the Asian countries, but it's not quite as been so widely used in a commercial setting. But of course, I will let Tony talk more about it. And so when we got the chance to have Tony with us um, for this evening, I was very excited because you don't often see speakers um, from Vietnam um, coming out, you know, and talking about mediation and commercial mediation. They, they usually have a lot of... Uh, um, of these webinars in Vietnamese, which will be difficult for us. Um, so Tony is really a, a very close friend and he has a lot of experience uh, in the arbitration circle and then now in the mediation circle. Um, I'll, I'll let him share a little bit more details about his specific um, qualifications and everything. But um, Tony is really a friend and I'm very happy to have him here with us tonight. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, uh, Marcus and Laura for uh, firstly, um, giving uh, me the chance to uh, speak in uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, I think uh, uh, in Vietnam, we have very long uh, mediation uh, practice, as Marcus just mentioned. Uh, we just did not realize that uh, we are doing mediation. Uh, mm. It's it just a grassroots uh, mediation. Uh, but uh, when we talk about uh, professional commercial mediation, it just uh, only started a few years ago. Um, I think uh, I will share a little bit uh, with you with my slides. So I will introduce a little bit about the um, background in Vietnam and then I will compare the Singapore Convention uh, when we talk about and the existing legal framework of Vietnam and some practice uh, in Vietnam and then the outlook. Uh, firstly, I need to talk about my organization. Uh, Vietnam Mediation Center is a part of uh, VIAC. Uh, I'm, I was just uh, appointed uh, uh, very early this year. Uh, and uh, it is fortunate and unfortunate because uh, just when I was uh, appointed, uh, the COVID-19 swept through and uh, we had quite a, a bad time with uh, uh, thinking about what we what to do uh, with the COVID-19 and several months have passed, but um, we find some, some good way to move ahead. It was established uh, uh, only in 2018, uh, about time that I came to Marcus uh, asking for some technical help. And uh, it, it was the first unit in Vietnam to provide professional uh, commercial mediation uh, service under the decree number 22. 2017. This decree is very important in Vietnam because it was the uh, legal framework for the whole uh, commercial mediation practice in Vietnam. Before that time, we did not have uh, uh, official uh, commercial mediation. So we can say that mediation is quite new to Vietnam. And uh, uh, VMC was built up uh, with mm, a lot of uh, help from the IFC um, professional um, uh, consultants, for example, Nina and Professor Najam also have a lot with uh, actually commenting on the uh, on the rules and on several uh, paperwork that we prepared when we set up the VMC. And uh, we also got help from the IFC and the MOJ 
uh, in uh, uh, build up the, building up the mediators, professional mediators. Uh, we got uh, the professional training programs uh, with uh, CEDR uh, in the same way as uh, CEDR um, uh, do the training in, in, in London. So we got uh, very cheap um, um, training courses with the same quality. And uh, from that, we got a lot of uh, uh, qualified uh, mediators, CDR qualified mediators. Uh, so we are one of the two uh, leading uh, mediation centers now in Vietnam. Uh, the uh, second thing I want to share with you is the legal framework uh, of Vietnam. Uh, we mentioned mediation uh, back in 2005 in our commercial law. Uh, in that uh, law, we defined mediation uh, uh, that uh, between the parties um, uh, and between the organizations or individuals, uh, if it's selected by the parties as a mediator. So uh, that's uh, the very first um, time that we talk about uh, commercial mediation. Then in the investment law in 2014, uh, we uh, also mentioned uh, that the disputes over the business investments in Vietnam could be settled uh, through negotiation and mediation. Uh, but the most important uh, uh, piece of uh, legislation uh, is actually the decree number 22. Uh, before that, we had the Civil Procedure Court 2015 uh, it set out the procedures for recognition of uh, uh, mediation results out of court. Uh, but that civil procedure court uh, is not really about only commercial mediation. It's uh, on the general recognition of uh, mediation. And um, the decree 22 uh, prescribed the scope principle and procedures for disputes um, uh, for uh, dispute resolution by commercial uh, uh, mediation mediators, commercial mediation institutes, and Vietnam-based foreign commercial mediation institutions. So for example, SIMI would like to set up some uh, office in Vietnam. Uh, you will have to look at the decree 22 to see uh, the conditions. And uh, also the law on mediation and dialogue in court. This has some uh, relevance to our uh, practice because uh, this is not about commercial mediation, but uh, it covers both uh, civil uh, disputes and also mediation disputes. So maybe uh, some, uh, some people in the mediation practice believe that it could uh, have impact on uh, uh, the commercial mediation practice and uh, specifically the mediators. So um, it was just passed on 16 of June, 2020, uh, and it will be effective uh, on the 1st of uh, January uh, next year. And uh, we are looking uh, forward uh, to uh, seeing how this uh, piece of uh, legislation will have impact on the Decree 22 uh, for commercial mediation. Uh, now we go to the difference between the Vietnamese uh, existing uh, legislation and regulations compared to, to the uh, Singapore Convention uh, on uh, uh, Mediation. Uh, the, firstly, the uh, definition of the two uh, uh, system. In the Singapore Convention, mediation uh, was, uh, was defined very broadly. Uh, as you can see uh, in the screen, it's a, just a process where the parties attempt to reach an amicable settlement with the assistance of a third person or persons. Uh, so um, it, it could be anyone uh, generally. Uh, so uh, in uh, mediation uh, uh, settlement by under the Singapore Convention, it could be very broad. But under Vietnamese law, the commercial mediation um, is um, a method of resolving uh, commercial uh, disputes agreed upon by involved parties with assistance of a commercial mediator. So this is a little bit uh, uh, less broad, uh, especially uh, if you uh, go to the details of uh, what is a commercial, uh, who is a commercial mediator. Uh, you need to, to uh, 
um, defined very clearly. And um, in fact, uh, only uh, commercial mediators working in or uh, operating in the commercial mediation centers like uh, ours, BMC, uh, or uh, ad hoc commercial mediator um, registered with the MOJ, the Ministry of uh, uh, Justice, uh, will be uh, regarded as, as commercial mediator uh, under Vietnamese law. Uh, secondly, sorry. The scope of application um, regarding the, the persons, um, uh, the parties who attend the mediation process. Uh, we can see from Article uh, 1.1 of the Singapore Convention uh, on Mediation that only two parties to the dispute having their places of business in different states. Uh, we don't have the uh, concept of seat of arbitration in the mediation. So it, it's uh, a more broad, uh, a broader um, uh, definition of uh, of the, the people. Uh, in terms of uh, Vietnamese law, um, the rational person is commercial mediators and the commercial mediation institutions and Vietnam-based foreign commercial mediation institutions. So we define the the parties and also the organizations, individuals uh, involved in the in the process and other organizations involved in uh, such mediation activities. Um, and regarding the, uh, the matters, um, the Singapore Convention just provide international commercial disputes and it did not provide uh, any disputes. But in, in Vietnam, uh, we have uh, Article 1.2 uh, defining the, the matters uh, which are disputes arising from commercial activities. And disputes, this is very interesting. We provide um, similar to the, the Vietnam arbitration law. We provide that uh, mediation could be between the parties uh, and at least one of them is engaged in commercial activities. So it could be uh, a commercial party and um, uh, a person. Um, and Theoretically, if we read it uh, uh, as uh, black letters, you will agree that uh, we don't need the commercial uh, disputes. We just need one party uh, being a commercial uh, uh, a party, uh, having a commercial activities. So some, somehow it is broader than, than the Singapore Convention and other disputes which are uh, prescribed by law to be resolved through commercial mediation. Uh, so it, it's not important, it's just uh, 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 like um, a calf out uh, clause. And uh, the exclusion, uh, this is also uh, different between the Vietnamese law and the Singapore convention. Uh, in Singapore convention, the uh, exclusion includes the personal family or household purposes, the settlement arrangement uh, relating to family inheritance and employment. Um, and the settlement agreements approved by court and enforceable as a judgment. So if you have uh, some agreement and you put forward to the court and the court make a decision uh, to recognize it, then it will be out of the scope of uh, Singapore Convention. Under Vietnamese law, uh, the exclusion is uh, uh, simpler. Uh, it just provides that disputes which are self-negotiated by the parties, then it will not be uh, under the scope of Decree 22. And also disputes which cannot be or are not mediated by commercial mediators, commercial mediation institutions, or Vietnam-based foreign commercial mediation institutions defining the decree. So you can see that the disputes in this case um, need to be mediated by either commercial mediators, uh, I mean ad hoc mediators, or the commercial mediation institutions like the MC uh, or uh, the ICAC or other uh, institutions, uh, or a Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam based foreign commercial mediation institutions. Uh, uh, it, it's not as broad as uh, Singapore Convention, as I mentioned before. Regarding enforcement, uh, we know that the convention uh, enforce 
uh, the uh, mediated settlement agreement uh, in uh, uh, any party to the convention uh, in accordance with the rules and procedures under the conditions uh, of the convention. But uh, under Vietnamese law, we have, we have not addressed the issue of uh, whether to enforce a non-Vietnamese mediation settlement agreement. Uh, this is one of the concerns that we have when we admit, uh, when, when we consider uh, admission to, to Singapore Convention. Because if we admit to the convention, then we will have to change the law or we have to uh, make amendments to be able to enforce a non-Vietnamese mediation settlement agreement. That, that's a concern from, from the authorities. And regarding the grounds for refusing to grant a relief, um, I'm not going to go through a very detailed this because uh, a lot of other speakers already mentioned. But what I want to highlight um, is from Vietnamese law perspective, uh, Article 4, uh, 417 of the Civil Procedure Court uh, provide the conditions for recognition of the successful out-of-court mediation results. Uh, firstly, it is uh, the parties of mediation agreement must have sufficient civil act um, capacity. So uh, it must have the capacity to, to sign the agreement if it uh, turn out to uh, not to be uh, um, a capable uh, entity, then it's not enforceable. Uh, secondly, any persons who have rights and obligations uh, towards the mediation content. So it must have the rights and obligations uh, towards the mediation uh, content. Uh, the translation of this um, convention is a little bit um, uh, not really a good English because uh, we haven't got the proper English um, uh, translation of the Decree 22 uh, and the Civil uh, Procedure Court. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, these are about the content of the mediation related to the persons um, uh, who have rights and obligations arising out from that, uh, that uh, mediation agreement. Uh, and either both parties uh, file the application to the court for recognition of the mediation. Uh, so the result must be filed uh, to the court by either party or both parties. And finally, uh, this is something interesting to, to be compared with the Singapore Convention. The content of the successful mediation need to be voluntary. Uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, the same, but it will not be contrary to the law or not contrary to the social ethics, uh, nor for evasion of obligations towards the state or the third party. So this is um, um, uh, something that um, the authority, uh, the lawmakers try to avoid. Um, the agreements, uh, settlement agreement to, to, uh, to sneak uh, out of the uh, regulations by, for example, uh, trying to, uh, to avoid the obligations uh, toward the third party. Uh, of course, uh, towards the state, it's uh, not really, um, uh, it's the same as a public order uh, condition. In practice, uh, we have uh, 20 uh, mediation organizations in Vietnam at the moment. Um, about seven of them are actually connected to an arbitration center and 13 of them are independent uh, mediation uh, centers. And we have um, um, the mediation, uh, Vietnam mediation centers have uh, quite a few cases, but all the cases that we have uh, uh, were related to constructions and they're all successful. So some of them are pending. But in the next uh, couple of uh, months and years, I think uh, the number will increase um, depending on, on the situation of the uh, disputes, uh, economic disputes. And regarding ad hoc mediators, uh, we have in total 81 mediators at the moment. In Ho Chi Minh 29, Hanoi, the main cities, uh, there, there are two main cities and some other cities. Uh, so the number of mediators uh, registered with the MOJ uh, at the moment is still uh, not, not a lot compared to other developed uh, mediation uh, uh, practice uh, countries. And the outlook, uh, we believe that we should have 
uh, admitted to the Singapore Convention uh, when it was uh, signed uh, last year. And it, it, it was really a pity when Laura and I keep counting the numbers and I, I saw a lot of countries uh, very similar to Vietnam, we did not um, uh, admit to, to uh, the convention. Uh, but uh, obviously uh, to the policy uh, makers, um, it, it's quite new to them. The first time I heard about this was uh, in 2016. And then uh, we, uh, we attended some uh, uh, working group uh, to um, uh, uh, sessions. And then we update from time to time, but still very new to the lawmakers. And the existing platform, I mean, the regulations, there, there are some differences between the, the, uh, the provisions of the convention and Vietnamese law. So the cost for admi uh, admission uh, is another consideration. And uh, the other is about um, uh, if we ask the question why we should admit, then what happened if we, we don't admit to the convention? Uh, if the result, uh, if the answer is, is not really negative, then uh, the government and the lawmakers will uh, have priority to some other issues and other treaties. And yeah, this is a list of the amendments, uh, the possible amendments needed. And that is one of the concerns of the policy makers uh, when, uh, when Vietnam joined the convention. Uh, for the future, I think uh, we will need to have more education on Singapore Convention. I haven't found any writing in Vietnam on the Singapore Convention, except some uh, sharing uh, by way of uh, slides like this. And also we need to do uh, more researches on the costs and benefits of Vietnam in joining the Convention. Uh, we have already done one, but I think it, it, it's, it's not done, it's ongoing. Um, the Foreign Trade University in Vietnam uh, with some uh, several researchers are doing that. Um, and we obviously we need to lobby uh, the uh, authorities uh, to, to, to get it uh, 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 approved. And uh, generally we need to develop the mediation practice and especially the mediation council practice in Vietnam uh, to, to um, raise the awareness of this uh, very new commercial practice and try to link it with the general grassroots uh, practice in Vietnam that we already had in the past. And uh, we also developed the, and we create the connection between mediation and arbitration to, to create the, uh, the mechanism like MedArp or Arp Med Arp. Um, that's, uh, that's all my um, presentation. Thank you so much for sharing. And so for everyone who's attending, the Q&A section is open now if you have any questions. But firstly, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky because I've got some questions of my own. So Tony, you've been yeah. speaking with Marcus and I about training, sorry, excuse me, training and certification um, of mediators in Vietnam. I mean, what benefits do you think that will bring and what problems does it solve, do you think? Um, I think the benefit of training is, is quite obvious. Uh, if we have more people um, knowing how to do mediation, um, it will be really a good thing uh, because uh, a professional mediation practice is, is different from, from what we have uh, done in the past. Uh, I usually have the, the, the same problem when I uh, do the training in uh, some um, mediation training courses in Vietnam, usually organized by the MOJ. Uh, when I talk about the, um, for example, the skills in mediation, you have to set up the logistics, you have to prepare some uh, good snacks and show people where to go when they have very long run mediation. Uh, a lot of people, uh, the audience, they, they just uh, burst out to, to, to laugh because they, they never uh, thought about that before and they don't even think that it, it is possible in, in the um, uh, context of, uh, of their practice because uh, they are advising the, uh, the law and uh, some of them are judges. Uh, judges also do mediation, but they never thought of that and they, they do not think that it is important. They, they keep talking within the room for the parties uh, without splitting them 
uh, in in uh, different rooms so the people outside can listen and hear what uh, the persons uh, inside talking about uh, the bargainings and things so a lot of these things could be solved by having professional training programs to make sure that the um, people understand what is commercial mediation and uh, and how to improve their practice actually it's it's good for them to have more successful uh, mediation uh, but uh, also uh, you said uh, the second uh, uh, question you, you certification said is, yeah so certification of mediators yeah the the certification of the mediators i i think it's to connect the uh, Vietnamese mediator society with, with, with the world. Because nowadays we have a lot of mediation, not only between uh, Vietnamese uh, and Vietnamese. Uh, we have more disputes, uh, cross-border disputes. And we also have virtual mediation. Uh, as we talked a lot in the last couple of months uh, when the COVID-19 happened. So for these things uh, to be solved, uh, we cannot just uh, rely on the mediation uh, mediators from from abroad we need to build up the forces of uh, good mediators uh, from vietnam and uh, by having the certification we will be able to to show the world or show the parties the foreign parties that uh, we have competent uh, mediators uh, with the international standards to to deal with the problem and to to um, manage the mediation process properly Great. So. so I'm going to jump in because I have so many questions. <laughs> yeah, and so, ahead. I mean, you mentioned that there's a lack of knowledge in some ways about mediation processes and what have you in Vietnam. I mean, are there any other challenges faced in terms of professionalization or even just access to mediation in Vietnam? Um, talking about challenges, I think um, the biggest challenge is the, the awareness of the enterprises. Uh, when we talk uh, about mediation, uh, the first question uh, they raise is that why should I use mediation if um, the other party could just walk away from, from the table and, and we, we have nothing to do about that. We will have to go back to the court anyway. So uh, they, they need more knowledge about how mediation could help uh, to solve their problems. So that, that is the biggest um, ice-breaking uh, issues. To, to make them understand the process and to educate the market and create the market. Uh, otherwise, we will have like a few cases a year. It, it's not really what we, we're looking at. Compared to the court uh, litigation, every year like a thousand and thousands of cases could have been uh, solved by mediation. Uh, that's the biggest thing. I think the second uh, problem we have is uh, with um, uh, with, with the uh, uh, legal framework uh, for the mediation. We, we have had the Decree 22 in 2017, which is a really good thing. Uh, but um, uh, the, other, the other competing uh, uh, piece of legislation is the mediation, um, uh, the, the law on uh, mediation uh, and the, uh, directions in, in court or next to court. So the court will usually uh, pass the disputes on to the mediation, uh, which is not commercial mediation uh, as we defined under Decree 22. So the, the government and uh, I mean the um, uh, authorities themselves, uh, they are having uh, different uh, directions of mediation. And if these two could connect together as, as the whole like broad mediation practice, it would be very good. But currently, there are two like different development uh, trends. Uh, a few years ago, people talk about uh, Decree 22, but now uh, people always talk about the, the, the law on mediation. Uh, and that, that uh, they are the two different things. Yeah. And they, they are governed under different legislation. So there should be some, some regulations to connect these two. Uh, very to, sensible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we actually have a question here from Teru Okaso. He says, are there court annex conciliations in Vietnam which work in a similar way to what we understand as commercial mediation in, for example, Singapore? Yeah, the court annex mediation in Vietnam, it has been um, 
uh, in the law for a very long time. So every time that you have um, uh, a court case where a party file a, a court case, uh, then uh, firstly the court will ask the parties to to uh, mediate. And um, the problem with this um, uh, kind of mediation is that um, the judges uh, who will um, make the, the decision on the case uh, will also be the mediator. So the main uh, stick that he used will be, if you don't mediate, I'm going to make a decision. And uh, we all know about the, the, the problems with uh, the mediator being the, the, the church. Uh, because if you are a mediator um, and later you become a judge, then the parties are reluctant to share all the information with you. Uh, they need to keep something for themselves and they, they will be uh, not very uh, cooperative. And um, that practice had been uh, for a, a long time before the, the law on um, uh, the law on the mediation had been uh, introduced. So currently the, uh, the law is um, uh, regulating the, uh, the uh, mediation uh, in court and the mediators will not be uh, the judge. Uh, they will just uh, pass the case to the mediator to solve. And the mediator is a diff different person uh, than, than the, the judge. Yeah, it will be similar to commercial mediation. And that's why I'm saying that it, it's a two competing thing. If it's not excluding the mediation under the decree 22. Okay, thank you. And we have another question here from Kin Hao, who asks, do you foresee Vietnam as being a signatory of the Singapore Convention on Mediation, for example, in five years time? Oh, five years time is quite a long time. <laughs> I have to say the beauty of uh, being a member of Singapore Convention is that um, you will have the whole benefit of what we have experienced uh, with the New York Convention. And it is even better um, than the New York Convention because you don't have a seat of arbitration. So you, can, you don't really need to care about uh, where the mediator just uh, signed the, the, the mediated settlement agreement. Um, there are a lot of things that we, uh, we, we can think of when, when we become a member of Singapore Convention. In fact, I'm one of the very uh, big promoter of uh, Vietnam being a, a member of uh, Singapore Convention. Uh, I, I don't think that it will take that long uh, five years to get Vietnam on board um, because uh, the, we are still doing research on whether we have to change the law. But um, I myself have had, uh, had experience with another convention that Vietnam uh, admitted uh, in 2017, which is uh, the VN Convention on the International uh, Sales of Food Contracts. And uh, this convention was actually the, uh, pushed by the enterprises. Uh, a lot of enterprises through the VCCI, Vietnam Chambers of uh, uh, Commerce um, um, they, and Industry, they pushed forward the request for the government to, to admit uh, to the uh, CISG, the VN Convention. And that is the first time that a convention uh, that Vietnam admit was actually uh, promoted from, from the private sector. And uh, I believe that uh, we can do the same way for the Singapore Convention because of many benefits that uh, could bring about uh, when Vietnam become a member uh, of this convention. Uh, I read the report uh, from the MOJ to the government when we were asked by the Singapore government uh, whether we uh, would like to become uh, uh, one of the first signatories of the convention. And uh, the feedback was that uh, we compare the two uh, legislations, the two pieces of regulations, and we see that there are some differences. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't think that the differences will be a problem. And uh, it depends on the way that we look into the law. Uh, if we think that it is a very uh, big issue, uh, a very like uh, fundamental problem of the law, then we need to make a new law. 
but uh, Decree 22 itself is not a law. It's just a, a bylaw uh, document. And uh, I believe that we will find way uh, to not to change or to make a new law in order to be a member of the Singapore Convention. And if we can do that, because talking about a law, we are talking about years, but if talking about another decree or maybe just uh, some like explanation to, to the government and, and the parliament, uh, the, the legal committee of the parliament, uh, it could be a, a lot uh, shorter time. And as long as we push uh, enough uh, forces, I think we can get it like uh, within two, three years uh, with the research that we are doing at the moment. We have done the same thing for the, the CSG and um, I'm quite uh, uh, optimistic that we can do it in less than five years. And it would be, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it would be a pity for, for Vietnam if we can't be a member of Singapore Convention in, in five years. I think, thank you. I think you've already partly answered this, but we do have a question from Alden Tan, who asks, what do you think is the most challenging aspect in getting Vietnam's law to be aligned with the Singapore Convention? Um, yeah, looking back uh, at the various uh, pieces of uh, legislation that uh, we think that might be uh, uh, affected by, uh, by the, um, admission of the Singapore uh, Convention. Uh, firstly, the Civil Procedure Court, and the second, the Law on Enforcement uh, of Civil Judgments, and the Law on Commerce, and uh, another degree maybe. Uh, but I think um, currently, I do not see um, a, a big um, problem with, with, with the, the uh, difference that we have in the same way uh, uh, that uh, the New York Convention has been uh, uh, been been uh, uh, applied in Vietnam, uh, I think uh, we we can just apply the same because the existing system already supports the new New York Convention, so there's no reason why it could not support uh, another similar convention uh, in the same way. Um, and uh, in, in fact, Vietnam has been advanced compared to, to the Singapore Convention on the scope of application, as I explained before. Even without the commercial, um, uh, this is just in theory, maybe in practice, the, the court may think an, a little bit narrower, uh, more narrowly. But uh, generally speaking, if we have a, a person and, and a company having a dispute with each other about something like a, a, a customer or B2C uh, uh, conflict, then we can settle by mediation. And applying the Singapore Convention will not uh, jeopardize uh, any part of law in Vietnam. The only problem that I think uh, which have, we have had uh, in the past with the CSG, with the VN Convention, is that um, the requirements of uh, uh, the agreement in writing. Uh, currently, the agreement in writing under the Singapore Convention could be um, uh, in electronic form uh, and it could be signed, but uh, under Vietnamese law at the moment uh, being signed uh, uh, will mean that uh, you have to be signed electric, uh, electronically um, by uh, a service uh, company providing the, the signature, uh, digital signature form and uh, you will have to change that in order to, to, to get uh, this Singapore Convention um, applicable in, uh, in Vietnam. But, but that would not be a, a big problem because the, uh, the regulation itself is, is under a decree. Uh, I mean, re related to the digital signature. So we can just make another decree to, to overrule that. Then we can apply the Singapore Convention. Yeah. Great, Thank you. that's really interesting actually, thank you. Now I've got another question here from Teru Okase and then we've got a couple from Marcus. And so he asks, you said that so far the commercial mediation in Vietnam has been in construction areas. Do you think this may change given that there are over 20 mediation institutions in Vietnam? Uh, I think uh, many institutions in Vietnam, they just set up uh, like um, a few months ago or a year ago because it's too new to everyone and many of them have not have uh, any cases. So uh, we are not sure 
uh, if new cases come to them, it would be um, financial or uh, uh, goods um, like disputes or any like uh, other disputes, same as construction. The reason why VMC has had a lot of uh, construction disputes is that uh, VMC is a part of Vietnam International Arbitration Center, VIAC. And VIAC in the recent years, uh, we have a lot of uh, construction cases. So they know about VIAC, then they know about VMC. And construction um, disputes in Vietnam uh, have tendency to, to go to mediation because it, it's really good that you have a third party, uh, a third person uh, regulating or, or administering your disputes and then giving some, some uh, like signature for your agreement. Uh, so it, it's really attempting uh, for, for the construction uh, disputes to, to go naturally to mediation. But I think if we uh, do our good uh, job uh, if we do our homework and uh, we uh, do the promotion of uh, of mediation, commercial mediation in Vietnam, I think the the most um, uh, the the biggest market is really about uh, the commercial disputes uh, of goods. It it should be the the most um, like uh, biggest number of cases, not construction, because we don't have so many constructions in uh, like like in in a year or, or two. Uh, but uh, the goods are disputes all the time. In VIAC, it accounts for about 40%. So I, I assume that uh, in VMC or general in commercial mediation in Vietnam, it will be about uh, the goods, uh, the trading disputes. So Tony, you know, um, last year we ran the first competition in Singapore um, for tertiary students, the International Mediation Singapore competition, and we had three teams from Vietnam, and yeah. all of them did extremely well. Um, <laughs> all of the judges here in Singapore, uh, and even the international judges who were in Singapore, they were all very impressed and amazed, and they had nothing but praise for the Vietnamese students, um, which which is not something they expected, I think, because you don't often see Vietnam. Uh, students competing in like Paris or even further abroad in other countries. So yes. do you think you can share with us what is the secret behind why Vietnamese students are so good at the mediation competitions? What makes them so good? Um, I think uh, I know the very root of this because uh, I was the one who brought this information of the competition to all the uh, universities in Vietnam. I think Mr. Dat, uh, the another mm, VMC that, yeah. deputy director. So our function at that time, I, I mean, we we make it our own like task to bring the information to all the universities and ask the law faculties of these universities to concentrate on uh, building up the the team. Mm. And after that, uh, we ourselves uh, we had the. Uh, the mentor, uh, the training sessions with them. So I myself did the training for I think two teams ah, out of three, and um, okay. and and we had very good trainers because uh, we, for example, myself, I have done the uh, the the professional trainings with the uh, CIR. Uh, yeah. It is a forty hours uh, a fully comprehensive uh, course, and then I did um, I, I I I did the facilitating. Uh, work for the first and the second um, mediation uh, practice course uh, with the CEDR for the other people. So we had a group of uh, about, I think, 20, uh, no, 72, 72 mediators uh, who are all trained by CEDR or very well-known international uh, training uh, centers uh, or tra training uh, uh, organizations. And uh, in turn, we met uh, ourselves the task to put our knowledge uh, through the students and they were um, very quick learner they they learned everything very fast and then they uh, had the discussion with each other and even the teams they had discussion with each other and then they made their way to to Singapore so I think uh, it, it's yeah it, it's very encouraging um, results but it, it has the uh, um, 
the reason behind it. <laughs> We're looking at the reason right now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that that was really great, and I mean, we really hope to see more coming out from Vietnam, and and hopefully an opportunity for Sydney and IMI to also contribute towards Vietnam's journey, towards uh, um, this this uh, drive to be recognized in its own right as a credible and um, international heavyweight for mediation. I think um, if there's any other country in Southeast Asia that should also step up to this, I mean, Vietnam would definitely be very much on top of that list. Um, incidentally, we are also planning, I mean, since we have you here, um, a follow-up to the competition uh, later this year. Yeah. So we hope to see more teams from Vietnam coming in as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yes. We can do, I will send you the uh, details separately. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we have one more question. Um, this is from yeah. Taula. And Taula says, Thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. You mentioned the lack of awareness of mediation. How do you plan to promote more awareness, not just for students, but also businesses? Yeah. Um, yeah, very good question. Actually, it's, it's our biggest question. Yeah, my management always asks me uh, how to do this. And uh, frankly speaking, I don't have a, a very clear answer on this because we have done quite a lot. Um, and um, it, it has not been very effective um, so far. I think uh, we, we are thinking of some other innovative way to improve this. Uh, the main problem with us at the moment is that we do not have the uh, the direct approach to the enterprises who have the most potential to 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 do this mediation. Uh, most of our existing uh, clients, I can say, uh, from the VIC, for example, they are doing arbitration, and um, the problem comes with not only the enterprises, but actually they come from the lawyers and that's what we are going to to deal with in the past we try to promote this to the enterprises we try to make them understand about uh, the benefits of mediation uh, the percentage of successful cases and how they can save time and save course uh, but very uh, quickly we realized that um, they are not the uh, decision makers uh, so we moved to um, uh, we move to another direction. We try to work on with the councils. We think that uh, most of the enterprises, they don't make decisions on the legal issues. They will leave that to their lawyers. And the lawyers in Vietnam, uh, I think they are currently, um, they have the, the need for, for, a quick, uh, uh, for a quick step to the litigation or arbitration so that they can get uh, a, a huge um, um, fee earnings. Uh, and, and I think that's a the mindset problem as well because uh, we don't believe that that's uh, the good ethical um, uh, way of uh, manner of uh, behaviors of the, of the councils. So we are building up the courses for the mediation councils instead of uh, uh, mediation for, for the enterprises. And we, we, uh, we quite um, we believe that this, this will be a good uh, method and strategy uh, to, to make the councils understand that they could gain more benefits to advise their clients to go to mediation instead of uh, directly to, uh, to courts or arbitration. Uh, and, and that's the main thing. But of course, we, we will have other um, uh, methods and other tools to do it. And we are developing the, the marketing tools uh, to, uh, to develop uh, the relationship with the organizations, with the business organizations, like the chambers. Um, and it's not only us. There are other uh, mediation centers. They are doing the same thing. But uh, we are one of the very first uh, leading organizations in the market. And we try to make it uh, very fast and very quick. If we find something not useful, we will just drop and need to, we need to move quick because this is a, a digital time. Uh, we are doing a lot of digital uh, marketing at the moment and uh, our courses, the uh, mediation council courses, we will do it uh, mostly online. As I share with Laura um, the previous time, yeah. 
Great. And actually, I think I remember you saying as well that you were actually using IMI's mediation advocacy criteria when developing those courses with council. Yes. Yeah. All right. So unless Marcus has another question, I have I have a final question for you. It's my favorite <laughs> question. Um, Marcus always makes fun of me for it. But say you had a magic wand, all right? What would mediation look like in Vietnam 10 years from now? Uh, is what it a are reality? Hopes? Oh, my hope? Oh, yeah. I hope a lot. That's the aspiration. <laughs> I think my hope is that um, uh, like 10 years ago, oh, we just had, this is uh, Vietnam Arbitration Week. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had uh, a very uh, interesting um, seminar this morning about 10 years arbitration uh, law in Vietnam. So 10 years ago, we had arbitration law. And now we have quite a good uh, arbitration practice in Vietnam compared even to the, uh, the neighbors uh, like Thailand or uh, Bangladesh or Philippines, we, we are quite advanced in, in, in uh, the way that we have uh, very good connections with uh, the other uh, jurisdictions in arbitration. And uh, we have very, um, like every, every year we double our cases. Uh, just, just to say very quickly how we develop, it's a booming business. So we hope that uh, mediation, if we have uh, good um, uh, methods and we have uh, good strategies, in 10 years, we, we expect that we will have similar or even uh, more cases because mediation is quicker, faster, and uh, smaller value. Uh, most of the time, then uh, we, we will see thousands of cases. And uh, we, if we have 100 mediators in our center, we don't have enough uh, labor force to deal with these cases. That's, that's mm -hmm. my hope. So in 10 years, Maybe we need to have a bigger team and other mediation centers will also have the same problem of having so many cases to deal with. Mm. Yeah. Sounds a good brilliant. <laughs> and, and I'm going to show Tony something because he shared us a, a badge. Uh, I, would, I wish I could show you an IMI one, but I only have this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so <IMI>. hopefully <laughs> this, this wouldn't take 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll forgive you, Marcus. <laughs> I would show an eye on my one. I just don't have All right. it. I'll, I'll send you some collateral. All right. Yes, please. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Tony, for your very thoughtful, very clear presentation, which I hope was a help for viewers and will be, of course, a help in the future. So thank you for joining us. Thank you as well to our attendees. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Laura and Marcus. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Thank Catch up soon. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night.